but thank you so much for having me today um just gonna start off with that the talks have been really cool yesterday and today um yeah i'm gonna talk to you about um my masters that i did um looking at corpse management in bumblebee colonies so um as we all know, like corpses can threaten social living um, and so disease management strategies are really important. So the kind of threats that are posed are um, the, the thing that causes the death spreading to the rest of the population, um, fungal or bacterial growth from that corpse um, threatening the, the rest of the community um, and attracting scavengers, which can then predate upon um, like living members of the society. Um, so we need to like be really good at uh, managing corpses and there are three main um, uh, behaviours, corpse management strategies that have been, um, that have evolved. Um, so we've got burial, cannibalism and necrophoresis. Um, and necrophoresis is where we pick up and carry out our dads. Uh, we're all bee people, we know that one. Um, so this has been really well studied in perennial eusocial insects. Um, for the first time it was studied um, in ants by E.O. Wilson. Um, and we've actually found um, that different ant species with under different conditions do all three of these behaviors. Um, termites both bury and cannibalize um, their dead. And honeybees uh, do this necrophoresis where they pick up their dead and carry it away. Um, but we actually haven't got any studies or very few studies um, into um, how corpse management happens in annual eusocial insects, such as be, uh, bumblebees and wasps. So why are we actually like thinking that that might be different? Um, so the, a typical perennial colony life cycle will have loads of individuals um, all throughout the year. There'll be tens of thousands in a honeybee colony, for example, um, where you have this um, negative fitness threshold that is crossed at some point over the years um, and so the corpse management strategy has to evolve. But in annuals, you have these um, three stages. You've got your colony founding, then the growth phase, and then the reproductive phase at the end. Um, and so that, that life history may be influencing the evolution of um, corpse management strategies. So for example, um, if it never reached that negative fit fitness threshold in the year that um, the colony was was um, the colony is alive for, then you wouldn't need to evolve um, course management strategies. Um, if it have, um, reached this negative fitness threshold very late on in the colony life cycle, then um, like in that reproductive phase when the colony is starting to go into decline, then is it actually worth evolving um, course management strategies because um, the colony is dying off anyway? So what's the point in, in making that energy cost of removing corpses or burying or cannibalizing. But then if that corpse accumulation threshold, uh, negative fitness threshold is reached really early on, then we would see the same um, corpse management strategies evolve as we're seeing in the other eusocial insects, but we don't know which ones or whether or not they even know. So um, the aim of my talk right now um, is to establish a new protocol um, for studying corpse management in an annual system, um, specifically in Bombus terrestris, um, and determining whether or not bumblebees can actually distinguish their dead, which is something that hasn't actually been shown yet, um, and to see what, if any, corpse management strategies bumblebees have. So. Um, as I said, I'm using Bombus terrestris. So as a quick reminder, um, we've got your queen, workers, um, food sources, and the brood. And that brood consists of several larval instars um, before they pupate. And during this talk, I'm only focusing on L3 larvae. Um, that will come up later. So um, what are we actually doing for the um, new protocol? So what I did um, was opened up the wax um, in a, a fully live colony with long forceps, pulled out the live work, uh, the live lava, and um, popped it back in again, or popped whatever treatment group back in again. And then, as you can see, just close up the wax and just do a little bit of finagling to get it nice and, and snug. Um, so I do this brood manipulation. I observed it for an hour um, just on that focal larvae and recorded all the interactions that happened. And then I left the, the colony for at least two hours 
um, before doing anything else. Um, so doing repeats or doing different um, um, treatment groups. So what you're actually getting here is um, the workers are, are having a choice when they interact with that larvae. They either accept the, the larvae, in which case the wax is sealed shut and normal brew care regimes. You see a regular feeding pattern um, and warming behaviors, um, or you get them rejected, in which case the larva is actually pulled out of the casing using their mandibles and carried to the waste pile. Um, as you can see here, this is an example of a, a worker carrying um, away to the waste pile. So um, the treatment groups that I looked at were an untouched control, um, where I just completely left it, just watched it for an hour to determine normal um, brew care routines, um, a disturbance control where I um, just opened and closed the wax. Um, I did one where I removed the larvae and then just put it straight back in again, um, just to see if there was a handling issue. Um, and then I did another one um, where I swapped a live larvae from one side of the colony with a live larvae from the other side of the colony, um, just to see if there's some sort of positional situation going on. Um, and then my final treatment group um, is swapping a live larvae with a, a dead larva that um, it comes from the same colony and was frozen either earlier that day um, or a couple of days before, and then rewarmed to the same um, temperature as the rest of the colony. And what I found from this was that actually in all of the control groups, um, I had almost all of the larvae um, accepted back in a normal brew care regime. The only um, group where there was any rejection were the dead larvae and the dead larvae were consistently rejected every single time. Um, and so this demonstrated the ability of um, bumblebee workers to distinguish dead nest mates. Um, it also confirmed necrophoresis as a corpse management strategy. That's what we would have predicted from um, honeybee behaviors. Um, and it's established a new protocol for further work should anyone else want to be looking at corpse management in bumblebee colonies. Um, then we went on to do a lot of um, some further work, um, which I don't really have time to cover right now, um, on um, how long the um, how long it took to uh, do each level in star. So I repeated the same thing um, using L1s, 2s, 3s, and 4s. Um, and then also looking at um, how colonial life, um, life cycle stage actually affects this behavior. So were we seeing um, a reduced effort to remove the colonies in later stages um, was a question we were trying to ask. And we are writing that up for publication still because we've got loads and loads of data. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. Um, thank you to all of my my lab group um, who were like absolutely wonderful at the time. And thank you so much for um, listening to me in my my talk. Cool. Uh, so we have time for questions, and I see there is two people. So the first person I think who had their hand up was um, Asa Garaja, I think is your name. I'm sorry if I mispronounce it. So yeah, ask away. Um, let's see, you're unmuted if you're asking. Uh, Let's see. So I guess we'll just go on to the next question. So guard Otis has a question. Yeah, hi, that was yeah. a really interesting talk. I guess I have two quick things. One, uh, you mentioned a disposal pile or something, um, which I presume is still within the nest cavity. Why don't they remove them completely from the nest cavity like honeybees would? And the other one is you showed the effect of instar there near the end on the removal rate. Is that just a function of the mass of the body tissue? Um, so we didn't actually give them um, the option in the, the first one that I told you about um, of removing them from the from the nest. Um, they were just in a, in a single nest box. Um, in a later study that we did, um, looking at whether or not the um, uh, life stage of the colony affected things. Um, we then gave them a foraging arena um, that was attached to it that they could go and um, take dead out. 
Um, and really, it was it was really variable as to whether or not they would take their debt out. Um, usually, what happened was um, they just um, deposited their debt in a um, like an area around the edge of the, the colony box, um, and that's kind of typical for um, like looking at um, bumblebee colonies. Anyway, they're really messy. Um, and it's it's possibly a function of the fact that it's an annual um, uh, species. Um, and um, you asked about the function of um, mass and um, larval instar. Yeah, uh, we've done a, a correlational analysis and um, they are pretty much weight and, um, and time to get rid of them are pretty much directly um, uh, attached there. So um, it is probably... Um, just the fact that L4s are so humongous. Thank you. So Clement asks, have you looked at Allison McAfee's work on compounds which signal a dead larvae in honeybees? Um, yeah, um, I definitely have. Um, that's probably the next step for this, this research is to seeing whether or not the compounds are um, the same in um, bumblebee colonies or something totally different. Um, I did have an undergraduate um, strip the um, uh, the cuticle hydrocarbons, uh, cuticular hydrocarbons off um, the larvae to see whether or not um, that was actually affecting anything um, and like transplant those onto like fake larvae. Um, and we basically just found something really weird and that the bumblebees like didn't like the fake larvae. But um, that was that was part of our, our goals to look at was cuticular hydrocarbons, death compounds, um, and we just kind of ran out of time with it. But yeah. Cool. And uh, Catherine asks, a uh, really interesting talk. How much do you think the lab context affected the results? Might removal of larvae happen if the nest had been in the field? Um, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think in an ideal world, we would have been able to look at it in the field, but it's um, it's obviously really difficult to look at bumblebee colonies um, with a camera because they're so like spatially disorganized. Um, but um, to be honest, I'm, I'm not 100% sure. You see um, some colonies where um, they just um, seal the, um, the larvae, like the whole brood, um, they just add more wax to it and they just leave that alone. Um, but that's not a consistent finding. And um, even when like experimentally um, and anecdotally, we were just like seeing whether or not um, putting an L2 back into um, a, a whole brood clump, the only the dead L2 was removed from that. So there are definitely some situations that we don't know about um, and definitely some huge gaps that, that are really valuable to look into from this. Mm 